stand together. This is the night of conference. We're going to worship Jesus with all our hearts, our minds, and souls. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Come to lift him up. Give him all the praise. All the glory. One day, he's going to break through that sky. Lord Almighty, hey, I got. 
Jesus be the center of your church. Jesus be the center of your church. Every knee will bow. And every knee will bow. And every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. We'll sing his name. Jesus. Kill him in the name. I want you to sing his name. Jesus. Over the name of the heaven. about Jesus. That's why we're here. Amen. You know, we read over and over again in the Old Testament how God said that you're to appear before me. Amen. To the men he commanded, every male needs to be three times a year. And other times he says, you need to come to that place that I have chosen for my presence to be. Amen. And how many know that God has chosen this place at this time for his presence to be? And what is so important is we just come and we appear before him. Amen. And thank God for the sermons and thank God for the music and the worship. But it's all about us appearing before him. Amen. And we come to present ourselves to him. And so we're going to open in prayer and we're going to believe God just for a visitation. We have some needs that we want to lift up. Uh, uh, Pastor Wallace Ryden is here at conference, but he's at TMC with a heart arrhythmia, staying overnight for observation. And so we want to lift him up. Uh, we want to also pray for Armani Sheriff Sharif. Uh, uh, he was in a tournament in Phoenix, broke a job, has a concussion. He needs God to... Uh, heal him. Uh, Myrna Martinez, uh, uh, just after having a baby, has uh, gallbladder issues. She's going to be needing surgery. We want to believe God uh, for her. We want to pray for the rest of this evening, anointing upon Pastor Carnegie, blessing upon our conference here. And so we're going to pray out together and uh, amen that we're going to have our uh, pastor Setson Nadamwapo come from Na Namibia. He's going to seal that for us and open in prayer. Let's pray together, can we? Father, by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. 
Thank you today for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you are here, God. Thank you for what you are doing in the nations of the earth, what you are doing in our fellowship, dear Lord. We are praying, God, for your visitation tonight, that you will move, my God, in the areas of our needs in our lives today, Lord. Every person present here today, that you will visit us, dear Lord. Bring a word in season, Lord. Communicate your will and purposes to your church tonight. We are dependent on you, Jesus. We desperately need you. Holy Spirit, I pray that to minister healing virtue to those that are sick, dear God. Miracles in their body. Save the lost, dear God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your presence, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed, Lord. Come on, church. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We want to take time to greet everyone that's here and welcome you to uh, our Bible conference Tuesday night. Uh, and uh, what a time we've had thus far. If you're watching online, uh, amen, and many are, we are glad that you're with us. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes people wonder, is it really worth it, all the expense and, uh, you know, all the preparations? I was talking to Pastor Setson, and he was saying that uh, travel time for him was 40 hours to get here. And so, uh, amen. Is it worth it? Amen. You know, it was just last night, we start the service, and everyone's saying, it was worth it. Hallelujah. Uh, because it gets better. Hallelujah. Every conference, how could God one-up himself? But He's inexhaustible, hallelujah. And so we're very excited. Uh, this morning was a tremendous time of seminars. Uh, I heard that uh, uh, the ladies' luncheon for the pastor's wives and evangelist wives was quite a time, and they had a great time. And so, amen. We're in for a good time, and we're only just really getting started. And so we want to encourage you to come and be part uh, of the services and set the table, as it were, by being in prayer. Uh, so we will be back uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning praying uh, in the fellowship hall, laying hold of God. And that's such a critical part of what happens during our Bible conferences. So come and join with us and be part of that. Uh, uh, we also just want to remind everyone, no food or drink in the, in the sanctuary under any circumstances uh, except for water. Uh, and also, please uh, help our parking attendants. The cones are up for a reason, and so that's not because it's being saved for you, but uh, uh, there are some people that uh, need to park close for a good reason, so if you will help them. Uh, and uh, take note, following the service, we have some fellowship party animals that are here, and, uh, but we do need uh, you to evacuate the building fairly quickly so that the cleaning crew can get busy. And uh, just to take note that the police and the golf carts, uh, as of 10 o'clock, they are no more. So if you're going to be outside and do take some time to be outside in fellowship, but uh, you might want to get your car if you're parked across some Irvington Road uh, and bring it over here. And that way, uh, amen, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, all the various elements of living in South Tucson, the dangers, uh, amen. Just enjoy your time of fellowship. So if you could help us with that. Uh, uh, we want to also uh, take note that uh, children must be picked up right after the service uh, uh, so the children's workers can uh, get about their business of going home and getting some sleep. Uh, we want to ask that you would be a good testimony in our restaurants here, also in the hotels, uh, uh, amen, you know, especially in the hotels, because people know that you're from the door. So uh, if you're eating breakfast, 
put your utensils in the garbage. Be a good testimony. Help us with that, and that'll be a great blessing. Um, we want to uh, also just uh, uh, remind the pastors that following the service tomorrow, there will be uh, a pastor's meeting uh, that'll be right in the sanctuary here. And so if you will help us with that and clear out of the building so that we can have that. Also, if you are a pastor and you're going to be planning a church or if you're going to be announcing an evangelist, see Pastor Garrett King and let him know about that. Uh, tomorrow morning, we will be starting promptly at 9 o'clock with Pastor Adam Neal, and then uh, Pastor Colin McLaren, and finally Pastor Garrett King. So it's going to be another great morning. Amen. We're very excited about that. Come and be part of that. Amen. Uh, tonight, uh, we are looking forward, as we always do every conference, to the good reports, the testimonies uh, that pastors uh, from all over the world bring about the things that God is doing in their city and with their uh, church. And so tonight, we're going to be hearing from Pastor Carl Cooper, Pastor Tom Connors Jr., Pastor Frank Bravo, Pastor Gene LaValle, Pastor Desmond Bell. Uh, but we're starting it off with a video report uh, from Pastor Leo Cespedes from Uruguay. And so, amen, let's listen. Madre de Tucson, mi nombre es Leonardo Céspedes y junto a mi esposa Marisa y mis cuatro hijas hace cinco meses que estamos en la nación de Uruguay. En primer lugar le quiero agradecer al pastor Harold Warner, al pastor Garrett King, porque ellos han hecho posible también financieramente amén, que estemos como misioneros en Uruguay. Eh, nosotros pastoreamos durante 10 años una iglesia en Argentina, eh, plantamos cuatro parejas, mandamos cuatro parejas al campo, pero Dios un día nos desafió a salir a la nación de Uruguay por primera vez como misioneros con toda la familia y salimos hace cinco meses. Dios está dándonos mucho fruto para la gloria de Dios. Estamos trabajando en los evangelismos como familia, comenzamos a, a evangelizar como familia a la zona, empezamos a hacer músicas, eh, música en la calle, nosotros solos como familia, eh, tardes de película y en poco tiempo Dios nos sorprendió con gente, visitantes de muchas partes. La gente pasa por la puerta, ve la marquesina, ve la, la cartelera y se acercan. Bueno, yo soy muy músico y comencé a dar clases de guitarra, de batería y se acercaron jóvenes, están viniendo a la iglesia, eh, comenzamos a hacer visitación, seguimiento junto a mi familia, nos metimos en todos los rincones de la ciudad testificando, evangelizando el barrio junto a nuestra familia. Dios nos dio mucho favor, amén, y una familia se salvó, esa familia fue clave, eh, trajo a otras familias de otra iglesia que también ellos estaban congregando, la iglesia empezó a crecer gente se está afirmando, está siendo edificada con la escuela dominical que estamos eh, pasando cada domingo antes del servicio, una escuela dominical para la familia. Eh, hoy tenemos un, una, una feligresía de 30 personas, tenemos un grupo de teatro que estamos trabajando los sábados en los conciertos, haciendo impacto tremendo en los conciertos y al menos una vez por mes predicado de sanidad y personas están siendo sanadas, los seminarios para matrimonios también están dejando mucho fruto matrimonios están siendo restaurados tenemos conciertos ya los sábados amén, abrimos la iglesia para oración los, todos los días a las 7 de la mañana y hay un grupo de 7 personas que estamos vi, eh, viendo este, la mano de Dios y están viniendo todas las mañanas fielmente tenemos una vez al mes discipulados para hombres junto a la iglesia eh, hermana de aquí de Montevideo también, en abril viajamos al rally en Buenos Aires que estuvo predicando el pastor Greg Mitchell 11 hermanos eh, fueron desafiados y viajaron a Argentina al rally por primera vez vinieron tan emocionados que hoy están trabajando junto a nosotros ellos quieren ver a su nación transformada para Cristo, tuvimos una invasión de la Iglesia Madre de Argentina predicó mi pastor, el líder de Argentina el pastor Juan Pablo Cardo el evangelista Fran Escobar que ahora justamente estamos teniendo un avivamiento junto a él, con muchos frutos, sanidades gente está siendo restaurada gente animada, nuestro edificio 
edificio está quedando pequeño y ya está el límite, estamos viendo la posibilidad de mudarnos a, un, a algo más grande, cinco meses hermanos y Dios está haciendo una obra esperamos a todos aquellos que quieran venir a, a visitarnos a invertir en la nación, evangelistas hermanos, líderes, amén que quieran venir a las piedras Uruguay Dios bendiga esta conferencia Dios bendiga su vida, los amamos y oramos por ustedes, los esperamos bendiciones Carl Cooper, my wife best and very best friend, Norma, pastor in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, amen. Glory to God. Uh, God's helping us. Uh, God gave us a very good building uh, right in the middle of town and uh, just a fantastic place, lots of apartment complexes. A lot of people that move to Tucson from California uh, end up there, and you just see plates all over the band. We're seeing uh, the fruit of a good, uh, good location. And so we, we do keep it simple. We work hard and keep it simple. Uh, we use parks, uh, Randolph Park, uh, Lakeside Park. We had a fantastic concert with Kevin Greer uh, last month at Udall Park. Uh, And uh, our services, uh, God's just really just helping maximize our services. Uh, um, like I said, we keep it simple. We were, you know, it's easy to get evangelists uh, just across town. We do that on Sunday nights. Hey, what's your weekend off? Come on over here. And, uh, and uh, no hotel, none of that. Uh, and so, um, <laughs> praise God. Not that I'm doing it on the cheap, but uh, these are good guys. Had great times with James Wilkins, Mike Webb, Larry Beauregard, and it just recently, in the last month, uh, we had uh, some great services that have brought an incredible amount of visitors. Just, just the last month with Herb Ruby, uh, Fred, and uh, just this last Sunday, Paul Campo preached uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, that was just a tremendous, uh, tremendous time just uh, lately, and all said, God's given us some fantastic people there, amen, and I just uh, uh, want to uh, just uh, thank God for this church, especially the two good people in the Tucson church, uh, I'm one of you, and I got saved in this place in 1979 as a freshman at Amphi High School, and uh, I don't know where I'd be without that, uh, this is a fantastic place, uh, And uh, this um, evening, I'd just like to say to Pastor Warner, amen, he's been my pastor for 44 years, and uh, I was 13 years old when I came in here, amen, I wouldn't trade him for anybody, yeah. amen. And so, uh, you pray for us, and I just gave my 42 seconds to Tom, so here you go. Praise God. My name is Tom Connors, and my wife Christine are pastoring in uh, Roseville, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. We took over a church in Minneapolis there about 18 months ago and just inherited a great core of folks, great folks there. And uh, God's really been helping us. Mini Minnesota is, or Minneapolis, the Twin City area, is a place of extremes. I mean, we've got extreme politics, to say the least. We've got uh, pretty extreme racial tension still there. We've got some extreme weather. We got there and, uh, in December, and uh, it hasn't stopped snowing yet. Uh, this year it started, really, it started in October, didn't end until April. So seven months of winter it makes a very short season to get outside, but God is really helping us. Uh, we're seeing God do some great things. When we got there, we had to get a new building, and uh, difficult finding buildings there in the city, very expensive, long-term leases. But God really gave us favor with a realtor, and uh, we got a very good building, great location, and while that building was being fit out, he also gave us a, a space to meet at while we were waiting, probably four or five months. Uh, we had a 40,000 square foot old CrossFit building, uh, and uh, you know, here's a handful of us meeting in that building in the Pilates room, you know, with all this open space, but God was helping us. And, uh, and so we had some great revivals. We've had uh, Pastor Robert Correa come help us. We've had uh, Pastor Alvin Smith come to a great revival for us. Uh, Lino Borgos just recently came out of Florida, did a great revival. Every one of those revivals helped and strengthened that group of folks that are there. And uh, really bringing the church together as a family and as a group uh, that will have influence and have power. And uh, I was thinking, I was... Uh, a little frustrated going through this winter. It was long, not seeing 
all that we really wanted to see as far as numbers of people come and uh, got the word that I'd be testifying here. And they asked us to put some pictures together. And as I'm putting pictures together, I'm looking at the pictures, and I was thinking, oh, we haven't seen a lot of growth or anything. And, you know, God, what are you doing? And, you know, so, but I'm looking, and as I'm looking, I'm looking at all these faces and some of these pictures, and they're all new people that have added to the church since we've been there. You know, just kind of one by one, they're drifting in, and, you know, people are bringing them out. Uh, folks are just seeing the sign or looking for a church. And, coming out. Uh, we've had just handfuls of folks coming out the last three months. A number of African-American grandmothers been coming out. I don't know where they're coming from, but the church is just excited, uh, and they're excited and loud, and it's just a blast, uh, and uh, just God's doing some great things. A couple highlights. One highlight, we had one girl come. She got saved, uh, or actually came out of prison on a Wednesday morning, came to service Wednesday night, got saved that night, uh, been serving God ever since, doing fantastic, uh, and uh, really believing God for it. Two seconds, I'm gonna take Carl's 10 seconds. Uh, I wanna thank Pastor Warner and, uh, and uh, the staff here. They've invested in us, they're behind us. The church here is praying for us, I know, and we are so grateful for that. We didn't get saved here, we're a grandchild of yours, uh, and uh, but the last couple of years we wound up here and we're sent out of this church uh, and feel like one of you, this is a fantastic church, fantastic fellowship, uh, and we're incredibly grateful. Thank you very much. Amen. Hello, my name is Frank, my wife Erica, and my two single kids, uh, adult kids, a son and a daughter. Uh, we took over the church in Lakewood, Washington in 2017. Uh, it's been six years since we took over the church, and I tell you what, God has done and is doing a great work there in the city of Lakewood. Uh, in the midst of all the ups and downs that we've experienced as a church, as a congregation, uh, we're seeing God move. We are seeing God moving in all the mist and all the chaos, and uh, uh, we've had a few revivals in the recent years. Uh, we've had some timely good revivals that are needed. One of them was with Pastor James Wilkins. Uh, we hadn't had a revival for a while until he came through. We outreached, but for the fruit of that revival, uh, we didn't really see much happen at that particular moment, that particular week, but uh, my wife gave a flyer to... A few girls, that, a few ladies that were sitting outside of the building one day, and, uh, you know, they, I don't know what they ended up doing it, but they said that a year later, they, they found this flyer, and a year and a half or so, they, they came out to church, and uh, they've been coming since. And so, praise God for that, and actually, one of them is here, uh, Benita's here with us. Uh, And so we've been praying for the military since arriving in Lakewood. And like I said, these, uh, the, the, the girls that received this flyer, they're a part of the military. And, uh, I'm, you know, they're loving God. They're growing. They're bringing people. And if you could just keep us in prayer for the military, breakthrough revival in that. Uh, then we also had evangelist Leonard Williams came. And uh, he did a, a, a revival for us. He challenged the church to exercise their gifts and uh, since then, people have been prophesying, they've been translating, uh, and they've been interpreting, I mean, and they've been just, you know, stepping out in faith. And so we appreciate uh, uh, the work that was done in that revival. Then we also had evangelist Joaquin Orozco. Uh, he came and encouraged the men. And I tell you what, God is doing something in the men of that church. When men begin to rise up, when men begin to lead, I tell you what, church is no longer just church. Things begin to happen. And so uh, we've been praying for the youth ministry and an ex-con. Uh, he started coming off and on with his wife and kids. He had mentioned he, had wanted to, he wanted more of God. I challenged him, just love God, just serve God, just come to church. They got baptized. They got filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and now they're leaders of the youth group uh, ministry. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, both Joey and uh, Jackie, his wife, are here as well, uh, the, the youth leaders of the church. And then also we're seeing miracles. We're seeing miracles take place. I've got 10 seconds. Uh, there's a man in our church, our worship leader. He had some physical issues, uh, was told uh, he, was, uh, he had, uh, was paralyzed from his legs, uh, was told he was never going to walk again. And I'll tell you what, God, the devil's a liar. He's here today with his wife and his son. He's walking. It's a miracle. 
we contend, we serve a great God, and uh, my time is up, but just appreciate all of you, Pastor Warner, the staff here in Tucson, we love you, keep praying for us. Hallelujah. Praise God. My name is Gene LaValle. My wife, Cheryl, and I were launched out of this uh, conference last year to go to that uh, great country, uh, Canada. Amen. <laughs> and so in October, we crossed the border. The border guards asked me four questions. Do you have any guns? Do you own any guns? Do you have any drugs? Did you carry a gun while you're in America? I said, no, 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 no. And we went in, and it was absolutely a miracle. There was nobody else there. We processed, and we're out of there in less than half an hour. Went to the Mike and Mary's house. Uh, there was about uh, eight to, to ten uh, brothers there. Un unloaded the truck. Uh, truck was unloaded uh, in, in two hours. Uh, we were in Canada. Beautiful time of the year, uh, October. Uh, uh, went to that farewell. They had the, the 35th anniversary and farewell for Mike and Mary, who did a tremendous job with that church. Uh, amen. Wonderful, wonderful congregation there. Uh, and so we hit the ground running, and so Jerry Fussell was already scheduled, so he did a revival, uh, amen. We had a youth rally in November. We had a Christmas play uh, as well. Uh, we do men's discipleship classes uh, every <clears throat> month. Uh, winter hit, and that is a, uh, 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 for somebody from Georgia for 33 years, that was a issue. I picked up uh, Ernie Toppin at the airport for his revival. It was one degree Fahrenheit when I picked him up. And uh, we talked about that. Amen. <laughs> we just had a baptism with 19 people being baptized. And we thank God for that. We're praying uh, uh, and believing God. There's a, a tremendous influx of Indians that are coming in. Uh, there are 500,000 immigrants coming into Toronto area every year. Five, it's a half a million people every year. Large part of that is, uh, is in the Indian population. Uh, and so we're praying God uh, would open doors there. When I got there for, I can't explain it all, but I'm in the middle of a bunch of Sikh Indians uh, standing there. They wanted me to speak with them and speak to them. Uh, and it was, uh, it was surreal, that was for sure. And so uh, we're having a great time. God's opening doors there. Uh, amen. We had our conference in May, uh, the second conference there. Tremendous time. Uh, started one church uh, in the GTA. That's the greater Toronto area. I want to thank Pastor Warner and uh, his wisdom, his guidance and hearing from God. Uh, I want to thank the Webs for the work that they did. I want to thank uh, 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 the Pinnocks for taking over the church. I want to thank the church uh, in Athens uh, for releasing us, the church in Toronto for accepting us. Uh, and I want to thank my wife. The from the very first time uh, I mentioned the possibility, uh, she never mentioned anything about kids or, or grandkids or family. She said, uh, you know what, if you think God spoke to you, uh, let's go for it. The Lord bless you. Uh, you bless one another. Bonjour. God. And anyway, my name is Desmond Bell, and my beautiful, specially designed, created wife, Matilda. <laughs> Pastoring in the southern city of France, beautiful city. And um, it's such a privilege that we had to take over that work from Pastor Charlie and Don um, from Santa Monica. Thank you, Santa Monica. Amen. And um, it's such a great honor, you know, coming from Africa, Sierra Leone, sending me as a missionary to a first world nation. This is a miracle of itself. And I'm so grateful, I'm so thankful, because this is something I never believed that can happen, because I didn't believe in myself initially. But thank you, Pastor Smith. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Thank you, Pastor Warner, for saying, yes, you can do it. And today we have a wonderful, wonderful church, you know, Marseille. In the south of France is uh, filled up with immigrants from all over the world. We have approximately 14 different nationalities in the church. And last summer, you know, a lot of young people start coming to the church. And um, they come, uh, have this idea that we can start evangelism through this social media. And they say, we can do, we can do TikTok. I says, what is talk, tick or TikTok? I say, 
and Insta and Snap. Because in the French system, you don't have right to preach or show your religious kind of whatever in the school system. So they bypass the system and start sending message, TikTok, talk, tick, snap. And, and we have all of these young people coming to church. And, uh, and, uh, and last, I think, in October, we baptized six of them. Hallelujah. <laughs> Gave their life to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, and, uh, and it's still going on, you know. And despite, you know, the grinding, uh, bureaucratic mindsets of the French people, God is giving us serious breakthrough. And I'm so thankful to God. I'm so thankful to my wife. So thankful to the, the Tucson congregation. And um, for just being behind us, it's not easy. But God is giving us some serious breakthrough. And just recently, we have Pastor Garrett, you know, it's so timely. You know, since after the COVID, there's so much going on. And this is the first full-blown, if I can say, the revival. It's a, a weekend packed full. And, and we have uh, at least, I think, 20 people, if we can recall, gave their life to Jesus during that time. We have men's discipleship class. We're in the street preaching. And it's so wonderful. But one highlight before I close, a lady used to follow us online. And I don't know what happened. And he said I was pulling an altar call and some kind of heat just fell on her and she started trembling and she came to church and she confessed, you know, I'm a witch. Because you can't, you know, I'm an African. When you see witches in Africa, you, no one needs to tell you that there's a witch. <laughs> no one. Amen. But so she's nice dressed and she says, I'm a witch. And, uh, you know, as you're pulling the, the altar call, I felt something, you know, please give me five seconds, you know. And she confessed. She says, now I know there is some power beyond my power. And she gave her life to Jesus. I says, wow. I said, look at a witch that is so nice. This. I'm an African. When you see a witch in Africa, no one will tell you, run. But anyway, I want to thank Pastor Warner and the Tucson congregation, Pastor Rob and uh, the, the Santa Monica crew, you know. And above all, I want to say thank you, Pastor Alvin. So you did an incredible work in Africa. It's unbelievable what God is doing. And thank you, Pastor Edward. You're such a wonderful blessing. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. We're involved in the greatest thing on planet Earth. There's not even a close second. This is an incredible, incredible work of God that we're a part of. I'm going to bring an urgent need to your attention tonight as the people of God. I'm going to talk to us for just a moment about the father of our faith. I mean the original father of our faith, Abraham. Because that's how he is addressed. Abraham is a man of, of enormous stature, even among those who were not saved and not Jewish. He's called the father of the faith. There are those who claim, take great pride in calling themselves the seed of Abraham. And the Bible says that we are the spiritual children, the spiritual seed of Abraham. And so we need to consider this one that is called the father of our faith. The one that was described this way by Pastor James of the Jerusalem church. He said, uh, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he, call, he was called the friend of God. He is being identified as the first believer. And so he could be called the archetype of the believer. An archetype is the original and the pattern for all that comes after. And so if the Bible is giving him that kind of an acknowledgement, we have much to learn from him. And one thing we do learn from Abraham, the archetype, actually he was Abram when he believed God. He wasn't Abraham until he was 99 years old. And so here he is, Abram, the archetype of our faith. And one of the things that we learn as we study this man's life is that his faith had an awful lot to do with money. Now, who was this guy, Abram, and why would God choose him to be the father of the faith or the archetype of the believer? Now, we know that he came from a place called the Ur of the Chaldees, 
We know that God called him out of that place. But who was this man? Well, our Abram was a nobody. He was a nondescript man. He was 75 years old. His wife was 65 years old, and they were barren. They left the Ur of the Chaldees with nothing. And so what is this telling us about the archetype of our faith? He was a nobody. He had nothing to offer God. He had no wealth. He had no special talent. He had no physical prowess. He was past his prime years. He's, he was, as some would say, in the last lap. And yet God put his hand on him. He's our example. He had nothing to offer God except the willingness to believe and then obey. That's it. See, we can do that. And so this tells us something about what a believer is. A believer is one who obeys. Otherwise, how do you know they're a believer? By what they claim to believe? The archetype shows us that a believer is somebody who obeys. He was 75, his wife's 65, they have nothing, and God calls them away from the familiar, and they simply obey. Genesis 11 gives us the backstory. It tells us that they left the earth of the Chaldees, and they went uh, as far as Haran. They went there with uh, Abraham's dad and Lot. His dad died at Haran, and the Bible says this, that at Haran, God prospered them with goods and servants. And so this shows us something else now about the believer, and that is that God blesses the believer. They're, he's a nobody. He's from a nowhere place. He has nothing to offer God, and yet he chooses to believe, and in believing, he obeys, and as he obeys, God prospers him. In this place called Haran with goods and with serv uh, servants. Now, it's important to understand, these were not wages. You don't want God's wages. Because the wages of sin is death. We want grace. Here is a nobody who just simply believed God uh, and grace is being poured out on this man. And he's being prospered at a place called Haran. Why? Because he's about to move into the promised land. If God calls, he provides. And they move into the promised land, and they're right smack in the middle of God's economy. Right smack in the middle of God's covering, and in the land, God prospers him, and he prospers his uh, nephew Lot so much that they can't occupy the same ground. They can't occupy the same land. And so you know the story. Abram says, pick a direction, Lot, and I'll go the other way. And so Lot chooses the well-watered plains of the Jordan and pitches his tent toward Sodom and eventually moves in and buys a house. Abram continues to dwell in tents, living in the promised land, and he continues to prosper. So what is a believer? A believer is one who is blessed of God, and when he is blessed of God... He says, it's not my money. Say that with me right now. It's not my money. Not everybody said that. <laughs> and a lot of you who did, it kind of rubbed you the wrong way. It's not my money. He had nothing. Now, maybe when you got saved, you were already set up. When you got saved, you were a blessing to society. God was glad to get you in the kingdom because you had your head screwed on right and you already had your own money. Was that you? It wasn't me. He's the archetype. The nobody from nowhere with nothing. But he believed. And we know he believed. Why? Because he obeyed. And when he obeyed, the God of heaven blessed him and he said, this is not my money. This money is there for God's purpose in the land. Let me just tell you, if you believe that the money is yours, then what I'm doing right now is something called charity. 
And you're going to expect a receipt at the end of the year for your charity. If you say it's not my money, then this is about destiny. So he's in the land. And he is doing the will of God. And then suddenly a messenger comes to him and brings urgent news. He says, your nephew Lot and his family and all the people of the plains of the Jordan were taken captive by Chedorlaomer and and an army representing five kings. Abram didn't have a chance to think about it. He didn't have a chance to pray about it. He had to act now. This is an urgent need. What does this tell us about a believer? A believer is going to be called upon to meet the urgent need. Paul was writing to Titus, and he said, Let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs. And so he's being confronted with these urgent needs. His nephew Lot, his uh, his family, and all the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah have been taken captive. And he responds immediately with what he has. 318 servants born in his house and flocks and herds. Uh, But that's not a lot compared to the armies of five kings. But he responds immediately. Why? Because he's there in the land to do the will of God and it's not his money. So he's all in. And of course, God does a miracle. God performs a very powerful miracle of deliverance. And who does he deliver? He delivers the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're fighting for the same people. He's the archetype. We're a believer like him. We're in the land. He's blessed us. We have his money. And he brings the urgent need. Uh, The people of Sodom and Gomorrah need a deliverer. So what is a believer? A believer is one who can respond immediately to the urgent need. Because it's not my money. Now he sees God do a powerful deliverance. But you know what? This was a war. And wars are costly. And he's walking back home and he's pondering the great cost of just uh, having gone to war with five armies. No doubt he's going to have to tell his wife uh, that some of their beloved servants are not coming home. He spent a massive amount of money. And if you're a church planter, you know what it is to have to be confronted by the urgent need. And I don't know how many times I said under my breath, thank God it was there. Thank God it was there. I think as Abram was walking home, thinking about the good things God did, but the tremendous cost, he was just muttering to himself, thank God it was there. Now, as he's walking home, pondering this, he is met by two men, and both of them are kings. One is the king of Salem, the other is the king of Sodom. He's first met by Melchizedek, this one called the king of Salem. This man, Melchizedek, according to Hebrews 7, did not have beginning of days or ending of days, no parents. He is, in fact, a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus Christ. And it says in Genesis 14, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him a tithe of all. This is after the war. Then the other king shows up. He's the king of Sodom. By the way, do you know what the word Sodom means? No, it means burnt. Why? Because Sodom is going to get judged. That's why. And God actually cared about the people who were there. 
And the king of Sodom came, and it says, Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. And I'll take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap. I'll take nothing uh, that is yours, lest you say, I'm no different than anybody else. That I'm just after the paycheck. That I got to get mines. He says, I'm not doing that. He was a believer. He gave a tenth to Melchizedek after the war. Why? Because the tenth binds the covenant of the believer. The tenth acknowledges the fact that it's not my money. That's why some people struggle to tithe. But when you've uh, figured it out, it's not your money. It's easier. It's simple. It makes sense. And so this is the time to give. Much is said in the New Testament about our responsibility, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11. So let each one of you, as he purposes it in heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is, not, is, is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, believer, may have an abundance for every good work. But I want you to concentrate on that word, that phrase, an abundance, because it's one Greek word, uh, perisuyo, and it's actually the emphatic form of parisos. Parisos means an abundance. That's a good word. But perisuyo means super abundance. It's not talking about a one-time windfall, but it's talking about a, a constant flow of abundance. Three times it, that word's translated to abound or increase more and more. That's the idea of the super abundance. And so we're at a Bible conference. These are now the times that define us as a fellowship of churches. And in a Bible conference, giving matters more than any other time. Why? Because we're birthing. We're birthing churches. We're birthing ministries, pastors, evangelists, missionaries. And conferences are very, very expensive. We don't charge admission. We sponsor people. We fly people in from all over the world who need to be here. And every year we keep having them. Why? Because God provides the money for us to give to pay for the Bible conference. That means the believers are using his money for his purposes. And he's giving us the money. He has given us the money to meet this urgent need. So I'm talking about your superabundance. Now, the superabundance is the flow of blessing. And so if God has called us to pay for this conference, and he has, that means that we have it. It's in our possession to pay for this conference. It's a superabundance. And we're believers. I believe when you said it's not my money. That in your heart you knew that to be true. And I also believe that there has been a superabundance. That God has provided to you. And you have control over significant amounts of money. Even to the point where you have been asking God, Lord, what do you want me to do with it? I'm here to tell you, in YouTube land, this is it. It's not my money. And when we obey him with what he puts into our hands, he will replace it with more for the next time. He's blessed you. You have control over resources. I'm not talking about money that you need for your bills. I'm talking about money that's available to give right now. You're a pastor. God has put a number of things on your heart. You need money for a building. You need money to do the will of God. Maybe you have workers in the field. And you have money under your control right now. It's not enough for the building. But it's what God is going to use to pay for this conference. And you're going to say, hey, this is not my money. 
God is bringing the urgent need, and I'm going to respond to the urgent need. In Romans 12, verse 8, in a list of gifts of the Holy Spirit, giving is on the list. And it says, those who give with liberality. That word liberality or simplicity in the King James, it means singleness or undistracted. In other words, now. That if you have that gift to give or you want to cultivate the gift because God provides supernaturally, the way you give is now. You give instantly. You respond now. Immediate. The urgent need is presented and you give the money now. It's not my money. I want the ushers to come. And as they're coming, I want to bring a warning Because standing there at that meeting, Abram and two kings, the king of Salem, the king of Sodom, was another man. His name was Lot. Lot had just been set free. Lot was fearing for his life and the lives of his wife and daughters, but miraculously, no doubt he was praying. Miraculously, his father, his uh, rather uncle shows up and with some servants and they release them from their bonds. And not only that, his bank account got rescued too. And he's standing there with Abram, Melchizedek, and the king of Sodom, and he is sober and he is grateful. He had taken his family into Sodom. And their lives were put into danger. And he thought that they were done for. And God miraculously delivers him out of Sodom. Now he's back in the land. He's with his uncle. He hears this conversation. He sees what his uncle does. But Lot chose the king of Sodom. Because in his heart, it was his money. And he was going to go get some more. Thank you very much. So if Abram is the archetype for, it's not my money, Lot is the archetype for, it is my money. The question tonight of us is, whose seed are we? Bow our heads. If you're watching online, you see the ways you can give. If you choose conference offering, if you're giving online, that'll help us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you have provided to our hand all that is needed to meet the needs of this conference, even now, even tonight. We thank you for your faithfulness, for you have ever been faithful. Since we left our own Ur of the Chaldees with nothing, with nothing to offer, you have been faithful to provide for us, to strengthen us, to enable us. You brought us into this precious and prosperous land of destiny. And Lord, we are being met now with an urgent need to meet the needs of this conference where you are going to birth your purposes And I ask you to supernaturally bless every man and woman who obeys you this night. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we have special music from Tribute Heights, uh, Adrian and Mika. Amen. Let's welcome them as they come to minister. Testing, testing, testing. Check, check. How's everybody doing tonight? Make some noise. Make some noise, make some noise. We are, uh, we're excited to be here tonight. Uh, I won't take too long in the speech, just keep it short and simple. We're from beautiful city state, Los Angeles, California. And uh, we're just so, we're so glad to be here. We just want to say thanks real quick. We're just so grateful, Pastor Garrett, Pastor Alvin, Anthony, those in the back, Paul, Josh, doing the sound. We're just so thankful for you guys and the whole Tucson Church. Make some noise for the Tucson Church, please. This song, we wrote this song. We put this song together. We're excited to share it with you tonight. And before we came to conference, we were in a time of fasting and prayer. 
And I was approaching the time of fasting and praying. I'm thinking, what, what should I pray for? What, what God, what, what do I pray for? And the thought that continued to run through my mind and what was on my heart was victory. And what that meant to me was don't live in defeat, but you have to live in victory. So what came to my mind was I know God had already given me the victory. I know Jesus gave me the victory. So all that's left for me to do is walk in it. And in this song, we just talk a little bit about the problems. There's a lot of problems that we face in this life. And we all go through different situations, different problems. But I just thought, I just took the concept and the thought of we as people see our problems, our situations as problems, obstacles. But I thought, how does God see those situations? Does he see those as problems? What you're going through, I don't think God sees what you're going through as a problem. At least not for him. So we just want to share this song with you and encourage you guys, hope it inspires you guys, hope it blesses you guys, and we are ready. <clears throat> I got some things on my mind. Try to keep it fly like a plane, y'all know his name, Yahweh, he's my rocket. I ain't talking Dwayne in my picture, but I ain't talking frames. Made me rich, but I ain't talking gold chains. Hey! Still got problems that I face that I can't deny. The pains of depression trying to portray my life. So I bow my knee, got ready? the cross, and obey my faith no, no matter, matter the way. way. I obey my faith no, no matter, matter the way. way. At the cross, by grace to I. I am saved, alive in the midst of graves, I lied in the darkest cave, I swerve all the snakes in my way, got faith hey, in my veins, hey, along hey. my slave. Uh, you be a fool thing, you can live upon a free life, that's too breezy and easy, man having trouble seeing Elroy E, that's the God who sees, the God who sees uh, me, you gotta live a life by faith, live a life that's pleasing, Adrian talk to them real quick, the last few years that was been in my ears, you ain't nothing but a mistake and an error, I had to stop breathing in the prince of this pollution, Air before my crown of life, my position as an heir, threatened by fear, mixed in with some problems. I know God care, so I cast my care and I do my Ric Flair. These are the type of situations make you understand. These are the type of situations turn into a man. Now it makes sense why he had to reprimand. Looking back now, I can see God's plan. Look at God's back, that's where the whips land. Willingness to suffer under pressure, that's a chant. While the enemy sips coffee and scoffing, yelling, the woman is coughing. Fight devils, I do this often. Like, no, 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 no problem. Hey, hey, this is how you feeling? Make some noise inside over here. How we doing? Make some noise, middle. Make some noise. Second verse. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Second verse. Hey, hey. All this pressure on my faith, but God knows I'm yeast like. With all this heat, watch me rise again to my hey. feet. No matter how bitter defeat tastes like, I ain't no David. Give me a giant, I know the Lord will give me strength to slay it. A soldier in Christ, I'll stay it. No matter the storm, I swear, God, what you done for me, hey. I can never stray it. Helmet of salvation, hey. keep it tight like it's braided, like a doctor on late shift. God, more patience, smile on my face, always painted. So when I say Jesus set me free, I shout it out like that loud as mouth and proclaim it. I was lost, getting tossed by these thoughts like lacrosse. Round of applause to my God and my Jesus who died on that cross, but in my faith in my God. Woo! Faith in my God. Hey. What has this world come to? What do you run from? A run, run to, to alleviate pain. Have you ever let the mediator mediate Ready trauma that's start? weighing on your heart no. and brain? That's and believing in the name Clap. is the only thing Clap. to bring change. Clap. His promises are yes and amen Life for generation simple. to generation. My description, my depiction, I'm Clap. light affliction. Clap. That's light work. That same attitude and genuine faith is all I have to give up the less. Call that a lesson. Same two things I have seen from adolescence. As this world passes away and is ascending, I'll be standing still with my Feet planted on a solid rock, also known as a God that was my understand before you were reborn. Christ the God, the crown of life, you put on the crown of thorn, light affliction. Make some noise, everybody. Hey, 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 hey. When this beat drop, I want everybody in here making some noise. Y'all ready? 
you guys. For Tribute Heights, hallelujah. Amen. You know, there are some years that are important years in world history. Uh, I think about 1969, Woodstock, going to the moon, uh, the Jesus movement hitting full stride. But I don't know that that compares to 79, at least for us, uh, because a lot of good things we already heard Pastor Carl Cooper got saved, uh, the Ruby Brothers got saved. Uh, we launched a church, Paul and Linda Campo, into El Paso. Our fellowship sent a church into Australia. Uh, a woman by the name of Mary Castillo, she's Mary Webb now, got saved. And there was a gentleman by the name of Marty Carnegie. He bowed his knee at an altar at the Door Church. I was blessed to be able to pray for him to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And, you know, sometimes you pray for people and you're wondering, did you get it? Did you hear it? There's no wonder. Amen. We know. Amen. What a blessing Pastor Carnegie is to our fellowship. Let's greet him as he comes to preach. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It was a good year, folks. Praise God. You know, I grew up very religious. I've told the story a lot. My dad used to be quite a good gospel preacher in the little storefront Pentecostal church we grew up in as kids back in the Washington, D.C. area. And, you know, in all of those years, you know, we started playing instruments and singing in the church, but me and my brothers were never saved and never even thought we needed to be saved. Just growing up, very, very religious. I mean, you know, we had it all down. My mom and her sisters had a singing group, and we used to travel, you know, like to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, the areas around, and she would sing in all the little affiliate churches, and they would pray for us and bless us, and we were the devil. We weren't saved. <laughs> but here's the thing. Nobody took the time to challenge us. I can't remember once anybody saying to me, young man, are you a Christian or you need to get saved? And we traveled and all the pastors took good care of us and they even paid us money, you know, for playing music. And back then it was only like a dollar twenty five. But to us, we were young kids. It was such a big deal. And none of them, we met the bishops and all. They never said, hey, are you a Christian? Have you been born again? I got on a plane after joining the military. It was 1978, and I came out to Tucson, Arizona. I didn't even know what Tucson, Arizona was. And I got off the airplane. They didn't even have jetways at the Tucson airport at the time. You had to get off the plane and walk across that hot concrete. And it really felt like we were stepping into hell at the time. <laughs> I never felt anything like that before. And a gentleman met me at the airport. He was from the Air Force Base. They had sent him over to pick me up. I was just a brand new recruit, just coming from the DC area. And he had my name on a little piece of paper. He was sent there to pick me up. And he said, hey, are you Carnegie? And I said, yeah. And he shook my hand and said, my name is Mark Rogers. I'm a born again Christian. What about you? <laughs> my first step in Arizona. And so I started giving him the religious spiel. Oh, I go to church. My dad's a pastor. Blah, blah, blah. And it's all oh, great. Then you would love our church. And I was in church <laughs> the first weekend of me coming to Tucson, Arizona as a teenager. And I remember coming to the altar and praying and thinking that they were all crazy because they just kept coming to my dorm room. Are you going to church? Are you going to church? And I got so sick of them. And I was like, Wait, okay, I know all about church. Why you guys keep coming and knocking on my door and I'm smoking weed and I'm doing everything. And then, <laughs> and then I met Matt McDonald and a guy named Vince Redhouse. 
And they started coming and they just turned the heat up. You ask God to forgive you. You need to be in church. And, and I'm trying to explain to them I know. And Mac McDonald said, you don't know nothing. <laughs> and I came to church. I think it was Brett Heck and a guy named Greg Morgan who invited me to a concert out in Reed Park. And I remember kneeling down and giving my life to Jesus, coming to church, like Pastor Webb said, prayed with me to get saved. And I tell you what, God has been so good over those years. And here we are here tonight. And that was 44 years ago. Wow, God is good. Mm. So, you know, everybody's been reminiscing, you know, because it's the 50th anniversary. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something that was put into me way back in those days that I think is still relevant or should be relevant tonight. And I want to share this message with all of you. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter number 28. And most of us here in the conference tonight would be very familiar with this Bible passage about Paul the Apostle's shipwreck on the island of Malta. And so it's not an unfamiliar Bible passage. We all have heard it talked about. And I want to talk to you about when the, the serpent came out of the fire and fastened onto his hand and he shook the serpent off into the fire. And so I'm simply going to use as a topic tonight for my message, shake the snake. Everybody say shake the snake. Shake the snake. All right, you got it. Acts chapter 28, just the first five verses. Follow with me. Here's what it says in Acts 28. If you're ready, shout praise the Lord. Praise the, Lord. the Bible says, now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. And verse 5 says, but he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Lord, we are so grateful for 50 years of ministry. And because we're so grateful, we come to worship and to celebrate you. We pray tonight, Lord, as we come to the scripture that you've given us, would you just make it clear and open it up to us tonight, God, and just rekindle some of the simplicities that made us survive for 50 years. And we magnify you tonight in Jesus Christ's name. Everybody say amen. Amen. When I first went to Atlanta, Georgia, this is a very memorable story for me. When I first got to Atlanta, Georgia, one of the girls who had visited our church was in a very horrific car crash. And she was in a coma. Uh, they were pretty much giving up hope on her and a lot of neurological damage. And when I, I was asked to go in and pray for her, it was just a very sad sight to see her whole entire head had swollen and all of these tubes and wires. And uh, they were thinking of pronouncing her brain dead because of the situation. And in the room next to her in this emergency kind of ward was the boyfriend that she had who was also in the car when they crashed. So she's in one little cubicle, and he's over here in the other cubicle. So her mother 
and the lady from our church who invited me are over here with me and the mother of the boy is over here on the other side. So my intention was, they invited me to come and pray, so I'm gonna pray for this girl first and so I'm over here praying for her and the mother, I remember she said, you know, pastor, pray, pray because the devil is trying to take my child. And man, we laid hands on her and we prayed and we prayed and I spoke in tongues and I rebuked the devil and death and you know how we always do. And there wasn't any significant change, but I just felt good because there were so many people uh, out in the waiting room because of this boy and girl who needed a witness that God is a healer. And I just felt like God's going to show these people that he is not dead. He's very much alive. So I went over to the other cubicle where the boy was and, and I said to the mother, I said, listen, well, I'm going to pray for your son. And she said, no, I don't want you to pray. And I said, they called me to come and pray. She said, well, yeah, you pray for them, but I don't want you to pray for my son. And I said, did you hear what the mother said? The devil is trying to take her child. And she says, you know, I don't believe in all of that devil stuff. And I remember saying to her, I said, honey, you ain't got to believe in the devil. That ain't going to change him from still trying to take your son's life. And we didn't really argue, but she just kind of rolled her eyes and like, well, I don't want you to pray for my son. So I end up going back and talking to the other mother and we prayed just a little bit longer and she called me in two days that that girl who was about to be pulled the plug and pronounced brain dead, that girl had opened her eyes and was beginning to speak to her mother. Listen to what I'm saying. In just two weeks, she was out of the hospital walking, completely healed and sitting in church praising God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ooh. Well, the boy still remained in his coma and he was still over there in the ward. The mother is trying. I kept asking the other mother, how is the boy doing? Well, she doesn't want anyone to come and see him. She doesn't want anybody to pray for him. And she was asking the doctors, can we move him to a special unit? They moved him to another place called the Piedmont Hospital. And they were just trying their best to get, you know, get him the best care that they could. Well, nothing worked. And that boy eventually succumbed to those injuries and he died. And I remember feeling so sorry for the mother because both the guy and the girl were in the exact same situation. One is alive and praising the Lord. And the other one has died. These people were involved in speeding and drinking and drugs and all kind of stuff. Without a doubt, this boy probably lost his soul the way his mama was acting. It hurt me that I was so close to him and God used our church and the people who went with me to pray to bring healing and deliverance to this girl. And all it would have took was just two or three minutes of us to go and lay hands on that boy and God could have raised him up. And I remember praying that morning and when they told me that he had passed away and I knew folks, I heard the voice of God say to me, it wasn't the car accident that killed that boy. It was his mother's foolishness. And I hope that doesn't sound too direct and too painful for some of you, but if God does a miracle for one, do you know he'll do a miracle for everyone? And it hit me and I, I, I wrote the little story and wrote a couple of notes and I had it on my desk for a long time, just adding some notes to it. And that's what this sermon is here tonight. Because people don't want to admit sometimes that the devil hates us. And there's a whole lot of people like this mother that don't want to accept the fact that the devil in the Bible is as real as God and Jesus. And because times are changing, there's so much 
intellectualism. There's so much technology. There's so much new learning. There's so much in, 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 in medical science. There's so much in philosophy. There's so much life that has been so enlightened in our modern world that people have just decided to dismiss the devil. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I learned very early, way back in the early days of this church, that the devil is the source and the cause of all of our problems. And even when there was times that you felt like you had a handle on what was going on and, and what was making you cry and what was making you depressed. Even back then when you feel like, okay, I know how to sort this out. I, I'm going to tell you something. The devil is still somewhere in the shadows and no matter what makes you hurt, no matter what makes you cry, no matter what makes you unfruitful, no matter what makes you depressed, somewhere the devil is at fault. So I read something the other day that made me decide that I wanted to share this message. I never preached it before, never even put it together. But it was in one of the Christian leadership magazines and the gentleman cited a study that said 64%. And, and you know, I like to use percentages, but so many kids nowadays don't even get a good education. I just, I, 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 if I say 64%, they're like, duh, what's that? You know, so, <laughs> no, honestly, so it, it, it's better for me to say it like this, 64 out of every 100 people, listen, that's a whole lot of folks, 64% of religious people, this includes JWs, Mormons, Catholics, Pentecostals, Baptists, everybody that has some type of religious bent. So it's not just uh, people like us or born again people. It says 64% of all religious people surveyed said that they do not believe in a personal devil. So I guess that means everything that goes wrong is just bad luck. I guess it's just karma. I guess it's just unfortunate happenings and situations. But see, that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us that we have an adversary. And the scripture is found in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8 says we are to be very diligent. We are to have on our best guard because your adversary, the devil... Said he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Here's what the Bible says about the devil. He ain't no joke. The devil is very, very real. Uh, a gentleman got saved in our church. This was just a couple of years ago. And he came because he had fallen on hard times. He had lost his job through a number of situations. And because he lost his job, he ended up losing his apartment where he was living. So his girlfriend and his three children were kind of out. And so they were trying to raise money to stay in a hotel. A lot of people do that over in Atlanta. So there, he's got his girlfriend and his three children, his little family there. They're all in a hotel. Uh, they're hungry. Uh, he doesn't have a job. Uh, the money for paying for the hotel is running out. And he ended up getting a flyer and just maybe God can help me. And he came to the church, answered an invitation, and he started talking to me about his problems. So he attended the church for about three weeks and it seemed like, hey, this guy's beginning to get it. You know, and I'm about ready to talk to them about getting married. And so I remember talking to him about all the problems in his life. And I said, listen, let's pray and rebuke the devil. That's what I said to him. And he said to me something that I've heard many times since then. He said, you know, pastor, every bad thing that happens is not the devil. And I said to him, that's where you're wrong. And I can tell by the way y'all looking at me that all of this 
new wave of, of Christian belief and YouTube and stuff you're seeing on TV and stuff that you're seeing on the internet where everybody's talking about where, you know, some people just bring things upon their self. Yeah, inspired by the devil. And here's why I'm saying this to you, because when I, when I was a young believer, I was taught, rebuke the devil for everything that goes wrong. Listen to me. I even heard a preacher one time tell that old joke that some of you may have heard. It was an old joke that said, God came out one day and he saw the devil sitting on the sidewalk. And the devil was sitting on the sidewalk and he was crying. And so God walks over to the devil and said, man, what's wrong with you? And the devil looked up at God and said, your people blame me for everything, even stuff that I haven't done. And the way they told the story and preached it was as if the devil is not the cause of every bad thing. You see, the devil is crying because everybody want to blame him for everything. And some stuff, it's just your own foolishness. Sometimes it's just you not thinking you having bad judgment. And I still believe that if it goes wrong, the devil is in it somewhere. Now, why am I telling you that? Because that was put into me. In the early days in this church, that's how they used to preach when the evangelists used to come. They're going to cast the devil out of everything. They rebuked the devil for everything. And we had prayer lines that demons were flying everywhere. They was rebuking and binding and casting out. And I'll tell you what made this congregation so great and so successful is we were all bent on running the devil out of town. <laughs> See, when the Bible says he's your adversary, the word simply means that he resists you. Anything you're trying to do, the devil is pushing back. He is your adversary. The word means to oppose you. Come on, y'all say amen with me. It means that he is resisting. He is opposing. So every effort, everything you're trying to build, everything you're trying to do for God, the Bible revelation says there is somebody who's going to try to undo everything you do. Everything that we try to build, there's a devil who's trying to tear it down. Whether you're building a Christian life, whether you're building a marriage, whether you're building a Bible study, whether you're building a church, it doesn't matter. There is a devil. The Bible calls him the adversary. Come on, everybody. Oh, I can remember. Pastor Alvin can, can tell you. You know, Matt McDonald used to pick us up and he, 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 he spoke into our lives. We were young and we were just raw. But, but everything that he tried to convince us of is that anything that, that's bad is the devil. So drinking alcohol is not just a remedy for depression. It's the devil. Oh, I'm helping somebody right now. Smoking weed was not just a coping mechanism. It's the devil. <laughs> hey, he would even tell us, listen, he called, hey, I'm going to come pick you up for church. Oh, man, we can't come to church. And all we want to do is go play basketball on Sunday morning. And we, man, I, I'm coming to get you for church. Oh, I can't come today. He said, you know, anything that doesn't want you to come to church is the devil. <laughs> in our spirit and it was in our consciousness and if we could get back to it things could really change if the Lord tarry another 50 years because the first 50 were birthed with this attitude bind the devil rebuke the devil cast the devil out come against the devil come on can you all say amen 
and we didn't care what it was, if it was a, a headache or it was, I, I, I got fired from my job, it doesn't matter, I was tempted, everything. You blame it on the devil. I'm telling y'all something right now. So we have a big problem that has to be addressed, and that is that people, number one, they don't even believe in the devil no more. 64 out of 100 religious-minded people said they don't even believe in a personal devil who can be the source of, of problems and doubts and depression and setbacks in life. Well, I still believe that the devil is at fault. If y'all are with me, say amen. amen. See, if you ever stop blaming the devil because you think you've advanced so far, if you ever stop blaming the devil, you look at me, you're going to blame somebody. And what you're going to end up doing is blaming other people, blaming other races, Blaming other political parties and then you give the devil another foothold because now he's creating division Somebody listen to me tonight If you ever stop blaming the devil you're gonna be fighting the wrong battle Hallelujah and it's fighting the right battle that gives us the victory <laughs> Can you imagine somebody jacked up and tore up like Brother Alvin say from the flow up? Or <laughs> somebody told me the other day, jacked up from the back up. I don't know what all that means. But listen, can you imagine you got all kind of problems going on in your life like we all do and then you got the nerve to blame somebody like Pastor Warner? Oh, y'all don't want to say amen. See, I done heard it. I done heard it. I got them phone calls. Hey, you know, Pastor, why don't you shut your mouth? Well, I, well, I tell you what, the devil, the devil, the devil makes people bitter. The devil makes people sin. The devil makes people quit. The devil makes people give up. It's the devil. He's your adversary. And if you ever ignore him and stop blaming him, folks, we are in for a world of hurt. Man, I had this devil woman. She came to our church some years ago. She was so sweet. She was so nice, and so she started fellowshipping with the girls, and she started getting involved in some of the ministries, and she would talk to me, Pastor Carnegie, I never met a pastor like you, and what a wonderful church, and she would, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. And she was just going on and on, and she, she kind of sweet-talked her way into just about every activity of the church until the sisters that she was involved with started fighting against each other. And what was going on is in the dark and in the quiet, she'd be on the phone talking to this one sister about this sister. And then she talked to this sister about that sister. And then she talked to these two sisters about these three sisters. And she had all of this chaos going on. And when it finally came out, I mean, it was like almost a year of just girls not liking each other and creating all these problems. And I'm trying to figure what's going on. These girls used to serve God in church. Now they're complaining about the nursery. They're complaining about the drama team. They're complaining about the woman's Bible study. They're complaining, complaining. And I'm trying to figure what's going on. So I remember trying to counsel with her. Now, you know, sister. It's like she was too sweet for me to say, you the devil. And see, that's the problem with somebody listening to me today. See, they're just so sweet, you don't want to say it. But you, you better say it before they tear up the whole church. And I remember saying, you the devil. I said, breathe again. You the devil. <laughs> you know, in this Bible scripture,
scripture that I read to you tonight, God has told the Apostle Paul that he's going to be going to Rome. He's going to be a witness before Caesar. This is a powerful opportunity to not just change one man's life, but to literally change the workings of the entire world at that time for the gospel. They shipwreck and then they go to the island of Malta. So you know, the, 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 the devil got the whole ship crash and everybody's swimming, trying to make it to land. And then as he's building this fire, the Bible says this serpent, this viper, this snake comes out of the fire, fastens onto his hand and pumps poison into him. And they were just waiting for this man of God to die. Well, he didn't die. Hallelujah. I said he didn't die. Because the Bible says greater is he. Oh, that is in you than he that is in the world. Does anybody still believe it tonight? And so the, hey, come on. So the apostle Paul, listen, the Bible says that he shakes the serpent off back into the fire with no harm. So here's what I want to say to you for the next couple of moments. When the devil first appear on the pages of scripture, he appears as a serpent. Matter of fact, the scripture in Genesis chapter three, the very first verse, says it very clearly. It says that of all the animals that God created, Genesis 3 verse 1. Matter of fact, let me just read it to you so I don't make sure I, I, I say it wrong to nobody. It says, now the serpent, Genesis 3 1, now the serpent was more cunning, listen, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. That's a big statement. More than the lions and the tigers and the cheetahs and the cows and the horses. More than the hy hyenas or, 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 or listen, the, the, the sharks. And, and any, he said, more than anything God made, he said, the serpent was the most cunning and crafty. That's exactly why the devil chose the serpent. Because the serpent aligns more with the wicked, evil intents and agendas of the devil more than any other animal. Can you imagine if the devil chose a cow and started coming up like, moo? <laughs> no, he chose a serpent. Why? Because they're sly and they're slick. Says they're cunning, which means crafty and skillful in evil. That's the serpent, folks. And that's how the devil appears the first time on the, in the revelation of the Bible. Everybody say, help me, Jesus. Come on. And so the apostle Paul has this serpent. Here he is, the, 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 the very nature of the devil. And I'm going to tell you, every serpent has the nature of the devil. If anybody out here, you a snake lover? <laughs> Listen, I ain't hating. Just don't invite me over. <laughs> the devil chose a serpent for a reason. And you all have heard them stories of people with them pet snakes sleeping with them and stuff. And then you hear these tragedies about the snake just, he, he loves Sister Susie and she, you know, wrap around her neck and just suck the life out of her. You know, for me, all it takes is one. Just one person to be killed by a snake, that's enough for me. Come on, I, I'm telling y'all, don't be messing with no snakes. Moving right along in my message right now. <laughs> he shook the serpent off into the fire and there was no harm. Now, I know that everything in the Bible is there for a reason. 
Come on, folks. God puts everything in there for a reason. And he's showing you this exactly what every serpent would do. This is what the devil does. If he could kill us, he would kill us all. If he could rip us off and get us to backslide and to quit, he'd do it. And he tempts us and he keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. Some of you here, he's been pushing you ever since we had conference last year. And he's been ripping you off and robbing you and problems in your home and problems in your mind and problems in your marriage. And here is why it's been so painful. Because a lot of people have not acknowledged it's the devil. And even when somebody try to tell you it's the devil, you, you, you don't want to admit that it's the devil. But just hear what our scripture says, he is your adversary. And I remember what John 10 says, that he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Look at me, everybody. Anything that rips you off is the devil. Steal. Anything that kills like drugs and alcohol and gunshots and violence and sexual transmitted disease. Talk to me somebody. Anything that kills is the devil. Cancer and disease and sickness. It's the devil. It says he come to steal and kill and destroy. Anything that destroys anything that God is trying to do is the devil. And all I want to communicate to you in this message is we grew as a fellowship of churches over the last 50 years because we were so simple minded back in the 70s as to believe that you ought to blame the devil for everything. And because you can blame the devil, every service was a devil rebuking service. Every outreach was a devil casting out outreach. Every time we prayed for somebody, it was a binding the devil prayer. And it was the devil, this, the devil bind loose, we're rebuking the name of Jesus. And, and there was something in the spiritual atmosphere, something very dynamic that just wouldn't let the devil get a foothold. We just kept on binding and praying and pushing him back. Even though it seemed like it wasn't the devil, we blamed him anyway. Oh, yes, we did. Listen. I remember living in London and this really pretty girl shows up on a Sunday morning. She had this golden blonde hair. I mean, it was like the radiance of the sun. It was like that bright kind of blonde. And, and it was so pretty that when you see her hair, it was just like, oh. <laughs> and it was long and flowing. A white lady had blue eyes, kind of like Scandinavianish looking woman. And, you know, she came in. She was very well dressed. You know how the, 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 the well dressed British ladies do. They have these nice little scarves on. And so she came in, introduced herself, said, my name is Sarah Blue. So I remember Sarah would say to me that she has been a Christian for X amount of years. And I said, well, you're welcome. We're glad that you came to worship with us. And she said, you know what? I, I would like to join this church. And I said, well, just be around for a little while and see if you even agree with what we do. She said, oh, I can already tell. Sarah was dripping with lust. And over the next few weeks, just so many little things that she would do. I remember one, one of the brothers, Peter can tell you, she, she, she used to rub on his leg. Hey, brother. <laughs> and she came one Sunday and told me, she says, the Lord brought me here to be your worship leader. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, we already got a worship leader. She said, oh, but, but the Lord brought me here to be your worship leader. She was so nice. You know, when I started telling her no, 
all the things she wanted to do, she manifested. So I was preaching one Sunday, not even a word of a lie. I'm not even exaggerating. I was preaching one Sunday and she got up and walked out into the foyer of the church and she laid down on the floor in the foyer and started sliding like a serpent. Simeon is here tonight. Ask him. He can remind. He can tell you. And, and you know, they're, they're chasing her around and she's sliding. And they're, <laughs> Sarah. And so they're there praying, casting the demon. You come out. You come out. You come out. They're praying. And, and Simeon told me one time when they thought the demons had come out, she calmed down and she said, there's more. Listen, the prettiest devil I ever seen. <laughs> Listen, here's the problem is she's coming to some of your churches. You know, welcoming, you know, we're what? She's the devil. And she was going to go through that congregation and fornicate with everybody she possibly could. Here's what I'm saying to you folks. The devil is real. And he has one agenda and that is to resist what God is doing. He will challenge you every possible way he can to hinder any advancement in your life personally in your marriage, if you're married, and in any church, whether it's a pioneer church or a leadership church, the devil is very, very real. I just talked to a pastor friend of mine on the phone asking me for some encouragement and for some advice. I said, what's the problem? He said 12 people in his church just stopped coming, and these were all people of substance and wealth. It was helping his church to be a, a self-sustaining church. And they, they just left. He didn't do anything to them. He didn't do anything wrong. There was no abuse or anything. And he's just saying, Pastor, what? You know, because now I'm going to have to go back and get a job. Things are, you know, and, and he's just so discouraged. I remember him saying to me on the phone, Pastor Marty, what do you think I did wrong? Where did I, I fail? Do I call them and apologize? I said, apologize for what? He said, I don't know. I said, well, you can't apologize then. <laughs> but the whole thing was tormenting his mind. What did I do? Where did I go wrong? Where did I fail? And I remember saying to him, I said, bro, have you ever heard of the devil? I said, the devil is resisting what you're doing. And one of the greatest ways to resist a church and a move of God is to dry up the finances. He's pushing back. People are getting saved. Families are coming in and the devil is pushing back. And so people get up and leave. They don't even know why they left. I'll tell you why they left. Because the devil is your adversary. And in this message tonight, it, it, it's so simple what I want to communicate to you, and it is simply this. Shake the snake. Hallelujah. I said shake the snake. You know, over in Luke 22, it's an interesting Bible passage in Luke chapter 22. Let me read it to you real quick. Everybody getting the message so far? All right, listen to Luke chapter 22. And I can tell you right now, the, the, the devil is somewhere trying to stop somebody from hearing this. Shake him off. In Luke 22, listen to verse 3. It says, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him or Jesus to them. Now, Judas has been walking with Jesus all this time. 
Y'all know Judas used to cast out demons. Judas, he obviously had some kind of integrity before God because they let him hold the money. You only give the money to somebody you trust. It says Judas was holding the bag with the money. He's traveling with Jesus and, and he was there when Jesus anointed them to go and preach and cast out devils. Judas was right there. And then the verse we read says, then Satan entered Judas. Now, for a lot of people, when they preach about Judas, oh, Judas was such a bad character. Judas was such a dishonest person. Uh, listen, Judas had the devil in him. And he went out and made a deal for the 30 pieces of silver. That was the devil, folks. The Judas was one of the disciples, but the Bible says the devil entered him. And, and all I'm trying to show you, folks, is the devil can be in people. The devil entered Judas and what he did was completely under the inspiration of the devil. The devil can be in the boy you talking to on the phone. The devil can be in the girl you talking to on the phone. The devil can be in the kids you go to school with. The devil can be into people you enter into business with. Why do why, why you think we have such a mess? Folks, the devil, he is an adversary. He won't let you build anything. But the, 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 the answer in the scripture is that the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Jesus makes it very, very clear that you have power over the devil. And this scripture tells us very simply that this man, the apostle Paul, just shook the devil off. Y'all say it again, say shake the snake. Mm -hmm. Now listen, when I was growing up in this church, there were two songs that was kind of like the anthem. And you know, we got all these fancy songs now. And I love them all. But those weren't the songs that we grew up on. You know, these songs now have two or three verses and a bridge and two or three choruses and all these beautiful key changes. And you know, it, it, it's, it's just so lovely to hear. But y'all know we didn't sing like that. Everybody who got saved back in the 70s in this church, remember, we didn't sing like that. And guess what? We had revival. Yeah. Folks now got all the fancy songs and just like, where's God? Just listen. Just shh. Listen, I ain't trying to meddle with nobody. Just listen to what I'm saying for a minute. <laughs> we used to sing a song that went like this. I command you, Satan, in the name of, oh, y'all know it, hey, to take up your weapons and flee. Y'all remember that? For the Lord has given authority to all over the, can you think, hold on, hold on, think about a church service. You know, just Jesus, I love you. We didn't sing like that. Was like, I command you, Satan. And then we start stomping out, stomping out. Stomp. You know why? <laughs> because we were taught the devil is messing with us. Messing with our children and messing with our mind and messing with our money. And when you came to church, you're ready to do some war. I command you, Satan, in the... <laughs> the other song was, I went to the enemy's camp. Oh, yeah, come on. And I, I took back what he stole from me. Okay, stop. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> This was the worship service. 
this is how we praise the Lord by rebuking the devil and we encourage, we're going to the enemy's camp and we're taking back everything if our mind was getting crazy we are taking back our sanity come on we're going to the enemy's camp and taking back everything and folks can you imagine the, the, how, how the devil in that service start getting nervous the devil, whoo. somebody say shake the snake and then the devil get nervous in that environment and you just start singing and you can see him he start backing up I command you Satan the name. hey then you say hey whole devil you got to go <laughs> listen holy ghost churches have power over devils and demons hallelujah in Luke chapter 10 Jesus said I saw Satan fall like lightning mm. he said just like a flash of lightning that's how the devil was thrown out of heaven in other words the devil got a whole lot of smoke but he ain't nobody he has been stripped by Jesus come on say amen. amen and if you want to walk in that victory then you hold on to Jesus hand come on say amen you get in Jesus church you become like Pastor Warner said one of Jesus people and guess what you have power over the enemy the devil ought not to be running roughshod over people who speak in tongues come on everybody he said I saw him fall now he said that because the disciples had gone out and they saw demons coming out and they saw healings and they came back and were telling Jesus, guess what? Devils are subject to us. And it's like Jesus was saying, why are you acting surprised? Right. They, they, they were given a report. Lord, guess what? We prayed for people and then they got healed. We, we prayed for demons and they came out and they were like, celebrate. And Jesus was like, why y'all tripping? I saw Satan fall like lightning. Of course you're supposed to pray and they get healed. Of course you're supposed to cast out demons and they come out. Of course, because Satan has been dethroned. Say amen. No, don't say amen. Say shake the snake. In other words, what he's saying, he said, you have the power and the dominion given to you by God. The problem today is people just won't acknowledge that the devil is their adversary. And they won't admit that the devil is causing all of the problems. People want to act like they can administrate everything that goes wrong. That they can fix everything that goes wrong. This is one of the problems when we're trying to disciple people. We give them good judgment. We make good decisions. And then they think they can decision everything that the devil is doing y'all don't want to say amen I say amen for all y'all amen. amen you teach people to be disciplined and all of that kind of stuff and all of a sudden when the devil is fighting they think that they got a plan A a plan B and a plan C and they can somehow work it out I'm going to tell you the devil is against you and what you do is you rebuke the devil, you cast the devil out, you take authority of the devil, and you stomp the devil under your feet. <sighs> Listen, I remember when me and Brother Alvin were in the military out here on the air base, and we had wanted to do a Bible study and get like a home group. We had to have the home groups, and we wanted to do one on the air base. And we went to the chaplain, and the chaplain, kind of a religious guy, and he told us, no, we couldn't use the base chapel because it didn't be authorized. I said, well, you can authorize it, but he wouldn't do it. He, he was so scared of tongue-talking Pentecostals. So he told us we couldn't do it. Well, we didn't cry, and we didn't complain. We did what we were taught to do. Jesus, you Lord of all. And the devil is trying to stop what we're trying to do. Devil, we rebuke you in this man and we take dominion over you and him and his mama too and anybody else that we can. In the name of Jesus, we command him to be loose. See, when the last time you did something like that? 
If you're a wife, you can rebuke the devil in your husband. All up in the pastor's office crying. Blah, blah, blah. Go, he's sleeping at night. Put your hands in the name of Jesus. He rebuke your devil. I know what y'all brothers gonna do. Be sleeping with one eye open. Listen. You know what happened? That chaplain was moved out by the U.S. Air Force and a new chaplain came in who gave us complete liberty. In the name of Jesus. Folks, that's what happened when you rebuke the devil. You know, the devil likes to hide. They said he was hiding in those sticks. He likes to hide. And I'm almost done. Just listen to me. He, he likes to hide in them sticks. Some of you heard what was happening the other day when Target was doing all the LGBT clothes. It's been in the news all over the nation. And so people, re, you know, they, they started coming against and, and boycotting Target. And, you know, I'm glad people boycotting. But y'all heard what came out in the news afterwards that the guy who was the designer for those clothes was a Satanist. And we just think Target was being crazy. We think that this major corporation was just being woke. The whole time it was the devil hiding in, 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 in the LGBT section and hiding in the car Target corporate office. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And as it began to come out, you realize, oh my goodness, we're thinking that we're just gonna vote somebody out and we're gonna go in there with a little protest and a sign, you know, and the whole idea is it's the devil, the whole time the devil wants to take over every good thing that God is doing in our life. Well, let me close, see I'm closing my Bible. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee. The same thing he does to us, God says, we do it right back to him. We were taught years ago when we first started doing crusade ministry and getting out in world evangelism that you know what? We, we reverse the curse, turn it back on the devil. Some of y'all remember that. The devil, whatever the devil do, and say, God, flip it right back on that devil. He said, resist the devil. See, he resists us. And so you resist him. You say, how do we do it, Pastor Marty? I'm going to tell you. The, 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 when, when, when the Bible talks about resisting, it's very powerful. Because what he's talking about is doing something that causes the devil to lose his grip. Now listen to me closely. Says the apostle Paul shook the snake. Now look, look what he's doing. He's on his hand and he's shaking. What is he doing? He's trying to loosen his grip. He's trying to get them fangs out. He's shaking like get, get, get off of me. And the, the, the idea is to get him to dislodge those fangs so that his grip can no longer hold. So here is what I'm gonna leave you with. You've, when we talk about shaking the snake, this is not just some play on words where everybody stand up in the service and like. <laughs> now that would be cute, but the devil, he'll shake too. It's doing things that causes him to not be able to hold on. Like what? Like pray. He messing with you and you start praying. You start to tell about and you start to pray in the name of Jesus. Father, right now, I know it. And you start praying. You like Pastor Stephen said, in the morning, in the new day, in the night, you're praying. And what that, when you pray, the devil gets nervous and he, he can't hold his grip. That's why people who don't pray are always under the assault of the devil. 
things like staying in church. Every time the devil starts moving, folks want to leave church. Where are you at? Well, you know, Pastor, I was going through it. Go through it on the front row. <laughs> Say amen, somebody. If you're going through it, you go through it with your hands raised. Because, see, the, the, the devil can't hold on to somebody who's a worshiper of God. And if he does, he's got to lose his grip because you're focusing on God, not on him. I was on the airplane coming home and I saw this nature documentary of the, the it was in Africa. I was talking about in Africa, all the, you know, how the lions attack the buffaloes and the zebras and everything. And it showed this lion, you know, the king of the jungle. And he jumped up on the neck of a giraffe. Because, you know, lions, they, they get, go right for the neck. Now, y'all know giraffe got big necks. And that big old long neck ain't nothing but one big muscle. And so this lion, I'm watching it, he jumps up and right on this thing's neck. You know what that giraffe did? He started shaking. And I was like, look at that. And this big old lion started flying and he jumped back on him again. And that giraffe, that big old neck, and there's a boom, and the lion flies. And after about the fourth time, the lion just looked and said, I'm done with you. Somebody say, shake the snake. You got to shake him off. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't let him hold his grip. And because that, he kept shaking, shake that giraffe lived to see another day. We've got the victory in Jesus today. Can y'all say amen? Give God praise with us. Come on. Give God glory. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Bow your heads with me, Father. We thank you tonight for the victory. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you that you have given your people the victory. We're praying, Lord, should you tarry another 50 years, that we would go right back to acknowledging that the devil is our adversary. But you, O oh God, have stripped him by your blood on the cross. And now you've told us that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Help us remind us that the enemy wants to destroy everything about us. And let your people be aware that no matter what it is, small or large, somewhere in the shadows, there is an enemy, Lord, who hates you. And because he hates you, he hates us. But Father, we hold on to your unchanging hand. And we give you praise until we see your face. Please keep your head bowed, keep your eye closed. There's people in here tonight I'm so glad that you've come. We welcome you. But maybe you've come here tonight and you don't know Christ. It's so tragic in this modern world with all of the pain and the tears, the addiction, the drugs, the diseases, the division, the political, the racial. In our time, there's so much that's just gone wrong. And you live in that world with no hope except for another drug, another drink. It must be so sad and lonely to know that you have no recourse. But tonight, God's love is all over this building and he's letting you know that God sees every pain, he hears every cry, and he loves you with an unfailing love. Even in the midst of all of the darkness in your life, he loves you. And he wants you to be saved. And he's come to you tonight in this service and asking you if you would simply come. Would you have faith in the finished work of Christ? Would you receive him tonight as your savior? Would you repent of your sins and say, God, I've tried it all on my own. 
Now I have to come to you. Give Jesus a chance. Let him show you how much he cares and he'll give you a destiny and a purpose. So let us pray quickly before we dismiss. If you're in here, every head bowed, please. No one looking around. If you are here and you know that you're not saved, come on, you're not ready to go to heaven. You know it. If you were to die tonight, you don't have any confidence that you would be with God. If you were to lose your life right now, you would be so nervous because I'm not ready to see God. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. Sometimes it's a slow death, sometimes it's immediate death, but you cannot make it without Jesus in this world. Would you come? He's calling on somebody right now. And I want to ask, if you're here and you need the Lord, and you say, Pastor, I've been putting this off, but I need to come. Can we have a prayer with you before we dismiss the service? Come on, our heads are bowed. Say, Pastor Marty, I want to pray. I want to give my life to Jesus. Would you just slip your hand up and let me see it? Is there anybody? Anybody at all? Come on, help me out here. Is there anybody here in the building? Ushers, are you, are you looking out for them? Come on, in the name of Jesus. All right, we got a couple of hands over here. God bless you. Anybody else? One on your other for anybody else? Quickly, quickly. Another one back there. God bless you. Who else? Come on. Lift your hand to Jesus. You say, Pastor, I'm not right. The devil has been running all over your life and you don't have any recourse. You don't have God. You don't have the Holy Spirit. And you realize I'm just like naked out here in this world trying to do it on my own. <sighs> Come to Jesus tonight. Oh, are you here? Come on. Anybody else? Maybe you've been a backslider. You know, this is a wonderful Bible conference. Where people come and just say, oh God, I'm so far away from God. I really want to make my way back. Is that you? Backslider, come on, you coming in here tonight. We're so glad that you're here. For a lot of people, it's so, like welcome home. You say, Pastor, I just need to come. Rededicate myself to the Lord. Raise your hand. Let me see it. Anybody at all? Come on, in the name of Jesus. Anybody at all? Anybody, you've been backslidden. I see your hand. Thank you. Come on, you're right in the church and you've been backslidden. Your heart is away from God. You don't love him like you used to. Thank you, Jesus. If you raised your hand, keep looking up here at me. Look up, look up, look up if you raise your hand. Look up here at me. Look up, look up. Look. Come on, I want you to join me for prayer. Please, would you stand to your feet if you raised your hand? And would you come up here so I can pray for you? Come on, don't worry about nobody. This is a you and God moment. I just want you to get up out of your seat. Come on, my dear. Come on back there. You raise your hand. Come on, just come on in the name of Jesus. Come on. Someone's going to meet you right here and pray. Come on, God bless you, my brother. Thank you for coming. Kneel down right here. Kneel down right here. Come on. God bless you, my brother. Come on. Somebody else over here, raise your hand. Somebody else over here, come on. Church, we're all going to stand. And what I want you to do is if we can find a place to pray. Some of you, you have not acknowledged. You think every problem you've ever had is financial. You think everything is administrative. And you're trying to figure out in your own mind every kind of way to fix the problems. And you're not acknowledging that it's the devil. The devil giving your church fits. The devil messing the people up. It's the devil. It's the devil. It's the devil. It's the devil. You're trying to live for God and your mind just keeps getting all jacked up and you're thinking, okay, I need a counselor. You're thinking I need somebody to talk to. It's the devil. Rebuke the devil. Take dominion over the devil. The devil is real. Come on, your marriage has been all messed up and all you think you need is a marriage counselor. The devil. The devil. In the name of Jesus. Come on. And just start rebuking him today. Come on. This ain't no time of cute little worship. Just say, devil, in the name of Jesus. Tell him, I take dominion over my mind. In the name of Jesus. I'm taking authority over these habits. I'm taking authority over, over, over the quitting and giving up spirit. I'm taking dominion over the alcohol that I've been turning to. I'm taking dominion right now. You're not going to rob my husband. You're not going to rob my wife. You're not going to take my children to hell. Come on, take dominion. Say, no. Pray against it, so I'm not letting you do it. It's the devil. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Come on, cry out. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus will hear you tonight. Come on. And we cause the devil to flee. Come on. He'll begin to back up. The Bible says if you'll resist him, he'll flee. He'll have to loosen his grip. He'll have to let it go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of, hey, in the name of Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you.
save the Lord Who can hear our saving Who can make me new No do one thing and we're going to go. Listen, listen. I just felt the Holy Spirit just speak to me right now. There's people in here that are sick. And I'm going to tell you folks, you read the Bible. What did Jesus do? He went after sick and diseased people. And what he did when he started ministering to sick people, he began to tell the disciples about the different spirits. Devils and demons. Deaf and dumb spirits, blind spirits, spirits of insanity. He didn't just say, okay, here's a medical condition. He said, here is a devil. And there's a lot of you here, maybe some of you in your chair, some of you at the altar, you need a miracle. We are the sickest generation in America's history. So much medication flying around. And so a lot of people, maybe you're here and you've got some type of diagnosis that you're dealing with. Have you ever stopped? I know the devil has told you all this stuff about, you know, well, this is your condition and how it runs in the family and how it was from childhood. Listen, that's really cute. But Jesus never said anything like that. So the devil has done this. If you're here and you need a miracle, you don't have to come to the altar. Just raise your hand. Come on, look at all these people need. 
I want everybody to do something for me. If you're standing by somebody with their hand raised, just put your hand on them right now. Come on, wherever you are, just somebody, because we, we can't bring everybody up. Just, just, just raise, put your hand on them. Just put your hand on them. And I want you to plead the blood and rebuke the devil. Come on, rebuke infirmity. Come on, just do it with me right now. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over sickness and disease. We take authority and dominion over everybody. We rebuke it. We bind it in the name of Jesus. Devil, you loose God's people. You come out in the name of Jesus. We take authority over this in the name of Jesus. The blood and heart and lungs and nerves in the name of Jesus. Devil, you got to flee. We push back in the name of Jesus loose God's people and come out in the name of the Lord come on in the name of Jesus every deaf spirit every crippling spirit in the name of Jesus every blind spirit every deaf spirit in the name of Jesus addiction and alcohol you must loose the people of God right now in the name of Jesus oh Lord Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's begin to praise God. Come on. We live cheap. We are going to dismiss. Parents, remember, pick up your children. If you're staying to fellowship, you'll want to bring your car if you're parked across Irvington over. And uh, amen. Be here tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. We'll be laying hold of God. Uh, I wonder if evangelist Fred Gonzalez, you would just dismiss us in prayer.